My mom had always been iffy about me going to sleepover since I was a kid. I'm 20 now, in university, but being a broke college student, still living with my parents, who have never neglected to treat me like their little baby. Truth be told, I'm extremely thankful to be so loved by my parents, as I infinitely love them back, but at times, it can become suffocating. I met Myra last semester in junior English, and we hit it off immediately. She was one of those people you instantly connect with, and become very good friends with, very fast. She wasn't native to my city, and said she was originally from Chicago. She was beautiful, and I thought she was much prettier than I was. But she disagreed. I would sometimes even catch her looking at me with this intensely focused admiration. It really did wonders to my confidence. She was sweet, very intelligent, and seemed normal enough, and we shared similar tastes and hobbies. I was majoring in kinesiology, and she in physiology. We both loved parties, dolphins, and Malaysian food. But perhaps the oddest similarity we shared was a strong and rather secretive penchant for Barbie dolls. My love for Barbie dolls and their pretty faces had just stuck with me since I was a child, perhaps because I still feel like a kid sometimes. For Myra, she said it was more about the design. The perfect intricacies of the clothes, the hair, and the body parts, as she described it. It wasn't long before we made plans to hang out outside of school, and she invited me to a sleepover on the following Saturday and encouraged me to bring all my dolls. I can't wait to meet them. I asked my mom if I could go the next day. You barely know this girl. You'd like her, Mom. I invited her to come over next week. I was convinced that Myra would become a long-term friend, one that would eventually form a bond with my parents as well. Hesitantly, my mom agreed to let me go, but insisted that I come home immediately on Sunday morning. I nodded. Saturday couldn't have come sooner. I packed my four favorite dolls in a duffel bag and my sleepover gear in another. Myra came and picked me up in a blue Sentra. As soon as I got in, she smiled warmly and offered me a shot of Grey Goose. It was vodka on a Saturday night. I couldn't say no. I ended up taking four shots on an empty stomach and being the lightweight that I am, quickly reached the intimidating boundary between impeded consciousness and completely blacking out. We got to her place, though I couldn't exactly pinpoint where we had driven to. I could make out that she lived in a rented ramshackle house on the outskirts of the city. It was cheap and I'm broke, she laughed. My vision continued to spin and wobble incessantly. She helped me up the splintery front porch and we stepped inside. It was meticulously kept. Books, photos, furniture perfectly organized. Wow, Myra, OCD much? We both giggled. We made our way into what I think was the living room and sat down on the musty, cherry brown rug. She brought me some bread and a glass of water to sober up. Okay, are we seriously gonna play with Barbies now? I'm pretty fucked up. I could tell I was slurring. Well, maybe you shouldn't have drank so much, you idiot. Here, let's watch TV for now. Hopefully you'll sober up soon. Myra was strangely calm. If I invited a friend over for the night and she was too drunk to function before the night had even begun, I'd be pretty agitated, or at the least bit disappointed. She put on an episode of Friends. I barely stumbled onto the lime green couch on the side of the room. I remember hearing the clap, 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 clap in the theme song and only staying awake for a couple more minutes after that. I slowly drifted off into darkness. The next day, I awoke to see that I was no longer on the couch anymore. I was laying on bare, hardwood floor with a thin pillow under my head and a wool blanket sprawled across me. I was so hungry and still exhausted. I looked up to face a single, dim light bulb at the center of the flaky, gray ceiling and a set of stairs on the other side of the tiny, dark room. I was in a basement, my bag of clothes beside me, but the bag of Barbies was missing. My phone was beside the bag in a pool of sticky red liquid, dead. I hadn't bothered to bring my charger as I was only staying the night and don't care too much for excessively using my phone. My stiff body ached tremendously. I focused and took in my surroundings for about five seconds before I became blinded by a deafening headache. It didn't stop after that. Worst hangover ever. I held my head and felt cloth wrapped around it. Myra? I struggled to call out, my voice dry and raspy. No response. The sides of my head continued to pound with agony. What the fuck happened last night? 
I slowly crawled to the shiny metal boiler in the corner of the room to catch a quick glimpse of what I looked like. My tired eyes sunk into dark circles. My skin was filthy, caked with a sticky gray layer of dirt. The ragged cloth covering most of my head was dark blue, coated with blotches of dried blood. Had I fallen somewhere? Myra! I called out again even louder. The thumping inside my head grew stronger. I stumbled up the wooden stairs. All of her books and possessions were gone. The lime green couch and a couple of chairs remained. It was like she had moved out overnight. She, and every trace of her, was gone. My money was still in my wallet, so she hadn't conned me for monetary gain as I had first assumed. I gathered my belongings and hurried out of the house. My eyes narrowed. The surge of bright golden sunlight hit me like a truck, and I fell to my knees. My headache was unbearable. I don't know how long I was withering in pain before I finally regained the will to stand back up. I walked over to the narrow dirt road that passed beside the small house. Luck was on my side, and I noticed a rusted, silver Ford pickup truck hurling dirt behind it, driving towards me shortly after. I waved frantically, and the truck rolled to a stop. It was an elderly couple. Hello there, are you okay? The man called out in a concerned tone. To be honest, sir, I have no idea where I am and would just like to get home. Well, we're a long way from the city. Perhaps you'd like to get to a hospital first, sweetheart. The lady looked worriedly at my head. All I could think of was my mom. I had never gone to a doctor's appointment, let alone the hospital, without her and wasn't planning to today. Thank you, but I'm fine. My mother is expecting me. Hmm. All right, honey, get in. The man said hesitantly. I threw my bag inside and we drove away from the mysterious little house. Where to? Sheridan, Pittsburgh, please. I continued to hold my head. I had no idea what to think. Who the fuck was Myra? Why had she just left me? A medley of sadness, pain, and utter confusion consumed me. It felt like I had been gone forever, completely disassociated from the present. The subtle heat of the fall afternoon became magnified through the windows of the old truck. It was probably long past the morning I told my mom I'd be home during. Would you mind telling me the time? It is 2.44 p.m., October the 15th, the old lady said cheerily. The pain in my head stopped, paralyzed by the immense fear that suddenly engulfed me. It was October the 15th? The plans for our sleepover were for the 28th of September. I had been unconscious and inside that house for almost two weeks? God knows what happened in that time. Nervously, I uttered a soft moan. What's wrong? The lady looked back at me. I didn't want to go into detail. It's just this headache. It hurts so much. I broke into loud sobs. Let me take a look at your head, love. I was a nurse for 30 years. Jim, turn to the hospital. We're getting this young lady some help right away. No, really, it's fine. I just want to go to my mom. Trust me, sweetheart. Your parents will thank us. With nothing to lose, I consented. Jim pulled over briefly to let his wife climb into the back with me and continued to drive. Okay, let's see here. She raised her trembling, ancient hands to my head and started to unwrap the cloth. I shrieked in anguish. I could feel raw skin ripping off the top of my head. A wound? The lady only unwrapped the cloth off about a quarter of my head before she gasped and swiftly recoiled with sheer horror painted across her face, her eyes wide. Wh what's wrong? I whimpered anxiously. The lady covered her wrinkled mouth with her hand and pointed at the side of my head. I pulled myself up to look in the rearview mirror. My exposed head was patterned with streaks of red and pink. A swarm of little ivory maggots feasted on the glistening, raw flesh that burned excruciatingly upon touch. My hair completely gone. I had been scalped. I almost fell unconscious from terror until I noticed a red gash deeper down the side of my head. I struggled to pull the cloth back more, and then I saw it. At that point, the shock of the discovery outweighed my threshold for pain. I had to see the rest to confirm my suspicion. I ripped the rest of the cloth off my head to face reality in full. 
Hot drips of crimson blood ran down my face, into my mouth, all over my clothes and onto the seat. The lady screamed loud enough that it caused Jim to swerve suddenly and pull over. He too looked back and let out a frightful cry. Myra, that bitch. She'd taken all my hair and both of my ears. The subtle rustling of the maggots continued. When I was in elementary school, I had a group of friends. I can't remember all four of them all that well, but I remember Ginny, my best friend, clearly, and the day we went to her sleepover. It wasn't exactly a scary experience. It was just really strange, yet I can't place my finger on why it was. I thought that maybe no sleep would be able to help me in a way, so I will try to retell what happened that day to the best of my ability without any exaggerations. Now. The five of us knew each other since we were small and did everything together, and we had sleepovers so often that I feel like I had several homes. However, we never went to Ginny's house for a sleepover until that day. It took us years for her to agree on it. She always said that her parents were strict and stuff, but according to my mom, they seemed pretty easygoing. I always thought she was the one avoiding it because she was embarrassed of her house or something since it was pretty common for kids to sometimes feel insecure about bringing friends over. When we first came over, I couldn't understand why she didn't want us over. Her house was gorgeous, far prettier than ours. The outside of the house had a front lawn that was well decorated with flowers, and they had one of those stereotypical white fences surrounding it. We asked Ginny if she was secretly rich or something, and she just laughed. However, I didn't like the inside of the house much. It was pretty, too, but incredibly bare. The house looked brand new, along with the furniture, and even the walls were flawless. The floor was also clean, which made me uncomfortable in a way, like they were neat freaks and I had to be really careful. The house was also heavily scented with the smell of those sweetened candles. It made me sick. Her parents brought us to the living room. I remember the living room clearly. It was huge, like three times the size of mine but there were only a few items in it. Some couches and a rug, nothing else. This made absolutely no sense because, well, people are supposed to have more than just some couches in their living room. We sat on the sofa, which was leather and had that brand new chemical smell to it. And then Ginny's parents handed us pizza on paper plates. It was really strange how we were eating in the living room without a table, but we didn't question it. They tried to entertain us by telling jokes but even as elementary school students, we weren't really interested. They resorted to asking us questions, and the whole time, Ginny said like nothing. She was usually cheerful and talkative, but in front of her parents, she seemed stiff and nervous. Or maybe she was slightly ashamed of them asking so much. After pizza, and no drinks were desserts, they finally left. Ginny asked if we wanted to play cards and stuff. Instead, Another girl in our group said she wanted to watch TV because some show she liked was up, but then Ginny said she didn't have a TV. We couldn't believe it. After a lot of are you kidding and no ways, we decided to play cards, and someone brought along chips so we shared it. I had to go to the bathroom, so I asked Ginny, who then ran out of the room to tell her parents. I was utterly confused as to why she had to tell them, and even more when I heard her and her parents talking frantically before they entered the room. They looked incredibly nervous and then Ginny's mother told me to follow her. I remember the rest as clear as yesterday. She walked down the hallway to a door, and when she opened it, there was a set of stairs leading up to a second floor. I knew nothing about house design, but to have stairs hidden behind a door at the end of the hallway seemed really weird to me. Also, the hallway was really thin, so were the stairs. At first, Ginny's mother told me it was up there and walked away. I took like two steps, and she came running back. She said something along the lines of, I'll walk you up there, suddenly in a really sweet voice that was different from her previous tone. She walked upstairs with me to an identical hallway and then gestured to a closed door. Now, you may not believe it, but I am being perfectly honest about what I see next. I open the door and there is a bathroom, totally bare of anything besides a sink and a toilet. No towels, no cabinet, no cups or brushes for hygiene, absolutely nothing. I nervously closed the door and checked that the toilet could flush before actually using it. 
It just seemed more like a decoration than a real one. When I opened the door, Ginny's mother was still there, staring intensely at me. And then she walked me downstairs again. The other girls had already started to change into pajamas. I asked if we were going to sleep in the living room, and Ginny told me yes. We never saw her room. And this was crazy, because girls loved bragging about their rooms, and it was a given that at sleepovers we would go to each other's room. However, no one said anything, so I didn't too. We spread our sleeping bags side by side and they closed the lights. We whispered for a while in the dark, and then they fell asleep. I didn't. It was dark, but I could hear someone getting out of their sleeping bag and saw a faint outline of someone getting up. I was sure it was Ginny because no child would probably start walking around a house they'd been to in the dark. I heard Ginny walk away, and after a while, I fell asleep too. I wish I didn't. There was just something honestly unsettling about the whole sleepover, and I wish I had asked her about it. I'm sure there would be a reason. The next morning I was the last to wake up, and I woke up really late, like literally the moment our parents came to pick us up. It was too doozy to change out of my pajamas, so I just threw my clothing over it. My mom greeted Ginny's parents, and then the others before we started to leave. I told her I felt really sleepy, and my mom laughed at me and just asked me how the sleepover went. I whispered that I didn't like their house, and that they were probably really poor because they couldn't afford a TV, and Ginny wouldn't let us see her room. My mom, who had no tolerance for prejudice, told me to not say such things, and to continue being Ginny's friend no matter what. When I got home, I slept again, and it ended up me spending the entire day in bed. My dad was really worried when he got home and heard about me not feeling well. He checked my temperature and stuff, and I remember this strange swollen insect bite on my arm, and then later on, I vomited. I can't remember anything after that, so from here on, it's what my parents said. Apparently, when my family doctor came to check up on me the next day, he said I was just hungry. My mom phoned my friend's parents and had them ask my friends about what we had for dinner that day. They all gave the same answer, just pizza. My mom was pissed off and gave Ginny's parents a long lecture about how irresponsible they were. She said that they apologized again and again. I also have to mention something weird about Ginny. After I felt better and went back to school, Ginny asked me if I remembered anything from that night, and I told her no. She smiled and told me she was sorry. Even now, I don't know why the sleepover bothered me so much and why she said all that. But since two heads are better than one, maybe someone can tell me. About seven years ago, three of my friends, let's call them friends A, B, and C, were going to have a sleepover at A's house. We were all between the ages of 14 to 15. I lived with his grandfather, his grandma had passed away a few months before he was born and had lived a full life as a photographer, but she struggled and eventually died from breast cancer, which then took his mother about eight years later. Father was out of the picture before she was diagnosed. So that particular night, his grandfather was out of town for a funeral for an old war buddy, and we had the house to ourselves. We stayed up late playing Super Smash Bros. Melee, and we all crashed at about 2 a.m. on the floor in the living room. Later that night, I woke up freezing cold, which was odd because it had been a fairly warm day, and checked the time, 4.30. I looked around and saw a red blinking light on the coffee table. I made a mental note about that seeming out of place, but I was too cold, not to mention too tired to get up, so I rolled over and went back to sleep. The next morning, I wake up to A shaking me violently. I open my eyes and can tell by his face that something is wrong. I try to ask him what's going on, but he just points at the coffee table. On the table was his grandma's last Kodak camera. He tells me that it hasn't been out of his grandma's drawer since she's been dead. He's only ever looked in there. We try to blow it off. Maybe his grandpa was getting nostalgic because of his war buddy's death reminding him of his wife's death and took it out to remember or something. B, C, and I were pretty satisfied with that, though A still had some doubts. A week goes by, and we all had pretty much forgot about that strange morning, except for A, who had been stressing out about it ever since. He decided to go get the camera's pictures developed. He calls us all the next day. I can hear his voice trembling as he begs us to hurry over. When we get there, he throws down the bundle of pictures in front of us. We flip through them 
and most of what looked like some last scenic trip his grandmother took before she died. When we got to the last three pictures, I froze. B and C both gasped. The pictures were of us. All four of us captured in each picture, sleeping on the floor in front of the television. No one else was home that night. The camera had no self-timer. I still haven't been able to explain it and get freaked out when I think back on it.